Look, it's no secret that the government bailed out a ton of banks during the 2008 financial crisis. But what you probably don't know is that billions of those bailouts could have come from drug money. Yes, a lot of drug money. It might sound crazy, but there is a possibility that it's true. In 2008, Antonio Maria Costa, who was the head of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, said he has seen evidence that the proceeds of organized crime were the only liquid investment capital available to some banks on the brink of collapse that year. Gangs are now estimated to be worth $458 billion, which most of their profits coming from the drug trade. So why did banks need to be saved? And how exactly did this money make its way into circulation? That's what we are exploring in today's video. Welcome to another project. Before the financial crisis heat in 2008, regulations passed in the U.S. had pressured the banking industry to allow more consumers to buy homes. So banks started offering low interest rates, which was fueled by a housing price bubble. This led millions to borrow beyond their means to buy homes they couldn't even afford in the first place. When increasing numbers of U.S. consumers defaulted on their mortgage loans, U.S. banks lost money on the loans, and so did banks in other countries. Banks stopped lending to each other, and it became tougher for consumers and businesses to get credit. By December 2009, the market had bottomed a short nine months earlier, and the fear of a double-dip recession was palpable. This meant that banks had something known as a liquidity crisis. To put it simply, banks did not have enough money to go around. During this time was also during the fall of the Lehman Brothers. This bank had taken on too much risk without a corresponding ability to raise cash quickly, similar to the Evergrande crisis going on right now in China that is expected to cause another financial crisis. If you would like to know more about that, you can click on the top right corner. Lehman's bankruptcy sent financial markets reeling and understandably, banks went into panic mode. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 504 points, its worst decline in seven years. That was a 53% drop from its peak on October 2007. On September 2008, the collapse spread. Investors withdrew a record $196 billion from their money market accounts. If the crisis would have continued, businesses wouldn't have been able to get money to fund their day-to-day -day operations. And in just a few weeks, the economy would have collapsed. For example, shippers wouldn't have had the cash to deliver food to grocery stores. To put it simply, a liquidity crisis was in full swing and something needed to happen fast. In 2007 and 2008, drug trade was booming alongside the real estate market. Back then, North America and 27 European Union countries absorbed more than 80% of the global cocaine market, which was estimated at $88 billion. Gangs are now believed to make most of their profits from the drugs trade and are estimated to be worth over $400 billion, and that's according to the UN. They have traditionally kept proceeds in cash or moved it offshore to hide it from the authorities. It is understood that evidence that drug money has flowed into banks came from officials in Britain, Switzerland, Italy, and the U.S. According to head of the U.N. Office on Drugs and Crime, the reality that drug cartels and other criminal gangs, eager to launder their money, went on an asset-buying spree worth $352 billion, and that regulators turned a blind eye to this because the alternative was to allow the banks to collapse. So how did this money get into the financial system? Before we continue, Please consider liking and subscribing below. It goes a long way in supporting the channel. As we get into how the money could have gotten into the system, first we need to understand what is money laundering and where did he come from. The term money laundering is derived from the habit of the gangster Al Capone, funneling his ill-gotten gains through laundry marts to construct the pretense of a legitimate income. Al Ponce Capone, also known as Al Capone, or even more popularly Scarface, Capone was born Brooklyn, New York City in 1899 to poor Italian immigrant parents. There was nothing in Capone's childhood or family life that could have predicted his rise to infamy as America's most notorious gangster. He was the boss of an organized crime syndicate known as the Chicago Outfit or Chicago Mafia. This rose to power in the 1920 under the control of Al Capone and the period was marked by bloody gang wars for control of the distribution of illegal alcohol during Prohibition. Newspapers of the time estimated Capone's operations generated $100 million in revenue annually. He had its hands in all types of criminal activities, 
including loan sharking, illegal gambling, sex work, extortion, political corruption and murder. Capone wanted a simple yet efficient way to make his money look legitimate to financial institutions. When looking for places to funnel his unlawfully obtained money, he gravitated toward laundromats. What does money laundering have to do with cleaning your dirty clothes? This is because cash flowing into the laundromats was hard for law enforcement to keep track of, meaning large amounts of money could slip through the system unnoticed. He mixed the money he made from his legal business with money from crime and deposited it to banks as proceeds from his laundromats. He was convicted of income tax evasion in 1931 and died 1972, but the money laundering today exists because of him. The most important aspect of money laundering is disguising the link between the money and its illegal source. If we go back to the liquidity crisis, there was not enough proof that illegal money got into the financial system. Even Costa did not provide enough proof to back his claims, there are a few ways money could have been laundered into the system in 2008. After the criminal made money with a certain criminal activity, they start dividing their money into small amounts so that it will not be detected and then smuggling it to countries with less strict anti-money laundering regulations. But this is during the peak of the financial crisis, and when you have a pile of cash money at home, the liquidity crisis for banks might not really be a problem for you, but actually the chance you have been waiting for. During this liquidity crisis, there is a potential win-win situation with banks that are in desperate need of money and criminals that want to get their ill-gotten gains into the financial system without any questions asked. Even though researching money laundering is not easy to observe directly, because it is hidden on purpose by the money launderers, the source of the information about illegal money making it into banks is the United Nations itself, it has access to a mythical amount of statistics, and is deemed to be trustworthy and a reliable institution. Antonia Maria Costa mentioned explicitly that he has seen evidence and has no clear-cut reason to lie about it. On top of that, the IMF once stated that the annual amount of money laundering worldwide could be between 2 to 5 percent of world GDP, which would be around 1 to 3 trillion dollars in 2010. Money laundering worldwide is heavily concentrated in Europe and North America. The reason behind this geographical concentration is probably the big and advanced financial system in the Western world and the fact that it is a good place to enjoy your criminal proceeds and live the luxury life that is adored by these criminals. We appreciate you guys for watching till the end. Here is an interesting fact you need to know about money laundry. According to the 2019 Basel Anti-Money Laundering Index, the five countries most conducive to money laundering were Mozambique, Laos, Myanmar, Afghanistan, and Liberia. Don't forget to let us know what you'd like to see next in the comments. Until next time.